there was a fourth method um, that business right used, and she said this was the rule of thumb. And now I already remember the OECD has already burned down the rule of thumb in uh, in, in the BEPS actions. And they simply said when they when they rewrote chapter six that this is not an acceptable method. But she puts it in nonetheless, and she says 25% um, of profit or EBIT under this method and implied royalty is estimated to with reference to Schrepp's profitability, providing an indication of the benchmark proportional allocation to the profit between the licensor and the licensee. The rule of thumb suggests that the licensee would not pay a royalty of more than 25% of its expected profits for the sale of the product that incorporates a charge for the use of intellectual property. The rule of thumb is a reasonable assessment commonly used as a cross-check in valuing intangible assets. So it's a reality check. Below are the steps I would perform. I would review Schrepp's financial accounts to identify the profit from the sale of PepsiCo. I would calculate the EBIT on that before the royalty. I would calculate 25% of the EBIT as the royalty. And then Mrs. Wright conducted her own research as a substitute for typical EBIT um, and revenue industry. And based on the Schrepp's payments and information she had obtained from a market research, she had calculated a royalty payment based on the estimated EBIT, based on the assumptions detailed in 6.4. And the problem here was, remember, again, they didn't have data about Schrepp's. So whatever they tried to find, they had to look up in, 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 in financial accounts which were published uh, and, and, and data like that. But the, you wouldn't have the split between Schrepp's Australia's income from PepsiCo products and any other products that it had. And then she concluded, assuming that the payments are for IP, I estimated a royalty payment as 25% of the gross up of the EBIT being the estimated revenue as set out in my response, a gross up EBIT margin of 12.8%, which I think she got from, from, from the parent or from the local financial accounts. And assuming that payments are for IP as set out below, my estimate is a maximum royalty assuming a 12.8% EBIT based, and, and then you need to take 25% of that, right? Based on the table above my calculations in a royalty payment of 10.7% of the total payments under the EBAs. I consider the result above of the above calculation to be maximum royalty because it is a general benchmark that needs to be adjusted to take into account the following characteristics. Based on method one, um, compared to a general royalty uh, um, benchmark, the portion or extent of payments that would be for the IP would be de minimis because you can't do anything with the IP. Based on my analysis under method three, there are a number of bottling distributions that are royalty free and therefore I would consider nil the lower end of the range. The profit margin that I've adopted is based on SI holdings, as I said, because they didn't have the local profit margins, which may have a higher profit margin than the related only to bottling and distribution activities, which is what Schrepps Australia did. During cross-examination, Mrs. Wright said that Wright method four was capable of independently calculating royalties, but it was less precise and not her preferred method. In light of this evidence, I do not propose to rely on Wright method four in determining the royalty rate. And now the judge is done with Mrs. Wright expert witness testimony. When we look at Mr. Malakowski and his testimonies, we come to the following methods. <clears throat> One, Mr. Malakowski provided an explanation of the relief from royalty methodology. And since we talk about different methods of calculating the royalty in this video, I wanted to include this even though he didn't use it himself. And he said, the relief from royalty methodology is based on the premise that a property's value can be measured by what the owner of the property would pay in royalties if he did not own the property and had to license it from a third party. So you look at their profits and you say, okay, you know, if they, if they didn't have the IP behind it, how much of that would they pay to a third party? And we kind of get back to the 25% rule, right? Uh, described in, 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 in by, 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 by Mrs. Wright. Alternatively, this approach may also quantify the amount of income the owner would generate by licensing the IP to others. This method requires a determination of the projected royalty payments, which are derived by applying a royalty rate to an appropriate royalty base. Often the rate is a percentage of the net revenues derived from the product. So for instance, the 25% that we talked about, the base is determined by projecting the expected revenues to be generated through the useful life of the IP. So you need to make a, 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 a NPV value. And, and, and he also goes on to say that. He says, these are only the first two steps, the final step, calculating the present value of the IP assets by discounting the stream of royalty income payments to present day using an appropriate discount rate, but that was not necessary in this case. An appropriate royalty rate may be determined by examining the actual transactions. Royalty rates are also often based on the amount of profits, cost saving, or other income associated with the asset being valued. So you don't only have to use the revenue, but you can use other measures as well. A reasonable royalty rate with respect to IP is generally determined using the construct of a willing buyer and a willing seller. The transaction is evaluated in context of specific facts and circumstances at the time the IP owner and the licensee considers the nature, strength, and relative qualities of the licensed IP. So also Malakowski says, you know, facts and circumstances do matter. 
for reasons he explained, Mr. Malakowski did not rely on the royalty rate in, these, in, in that agreement. This method can therefore be put to one side. So it's another method that you can use for, for, for determining royalties, but they were not used by Mr. Malakowski. Mr. Malakowski had three methods, 1A, one 1B, one and 2. So let's see what these were. Mr. Malakowski described 1A in addition to license agreements directly involving PepsiCo, I considered third-party license agreements. In my search for comparable license agreements, I use and analyze royalty license rate transactions from KT Mine royalty source and royalty stuff. So we are again back at benchmarking. Mr. Malakowski accepted this method is the same as right. Three, ultimately he relied upon a set of 18 comparables. Mr. Malakowski stated that four of those license agreements were non-exclusive, whereas SWEPS was exclusive. He therefore made an adjustment to the royalty rates under those four agreements, and he does the adjustment by doubling the royalty rate. So this is an interesting assumption from Malakowski. He says the difference in price between an exclusive and non-exclusive license agreement is double the rate. Now, um, the judge does, does go into whether all of these were exclusive or non-exclusive, and one of them turned out to actually have been exclusive, but he never really tests this hypothesis that you must double the rate, which is, which is a pity. Malakowski summarized the outcome in figure 17, and here you can see what the outcome was. He talks about the medium and the average and the minimum and the quartile, and, and then he goes on to say that the, there followed various discussions about the appropriateness of some of the comparables. <clears throat> and, I'm sorry, this is what my summary of all of this and, and what I just told you. One of the non-exclusive agreements was actually uh, exclusive, and then the judge says, I will give further consideration to Malakowski method 1A in the section of these uh, of these reasons had a determination of the royalty rate. So the judge ends up using this method of Malakowski and, and says, you know, this is a method I use, but then he also says, well, by the way, Mrs. Wright has a similar method, which I believe was method four. Um, then we get to Malakowski 1B, Mr. Malakowski in, considered implied royalty rates. And he did this as follows. I also considered the implied royalty rates from public company uh, comparables. I relied on data from Markables, a database collecting public company information um, and providing estimated implied royalty rates from enterprise level transactions where the value is allocated to trademarks. Now, now Markables, it seems like, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a company that collects data, draw their own conclusions from that, and then publish these conclusions. And, and, and this trips Malakowski up. Um, the, he, he goes on and says the implied rates are calculated using publicly available financial data from transactions and a publicly disclosed purchase price um, because these are typically uh, transactions where you buy another group and, and, and then you, you publish you know, what the price is, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and, 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 and there were some independent uh, assumptions by Markables about discount rates, tax rates, revenue growth rates, et cetera, because that's what you need when you make a purchase price allocation, right, and, 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 and calculation. Based on my understanding, I understand that the extent to which Markables exercise subjective judgment conclusions is limited. Thus, I relied upon their royalty rates without any verification and sought to identify transactions that included the right use of trade names and trademarks in industries and segments similar to, to, to PepsiCo. I relied upon the product classification 231 non-alcoholic beverages as it was determined to include the majority of products from the relevant items. And these were the items that, 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 that both expert witnesses looked at when considering the price for the royalties. You know, the fact that you bought the syrup, the fact that you had to bottle, the fact that you could use the trademarks, but that it was limited, etc., etc. This refinement process resulted in 32 comparables Four comparable transactions report royalties above 25%. He excluded these four transactions. So in this video, whenever it's italics, that's what the expert witness itself were quoted. And whenever it's non-italic, that's what the judge wrote himself. Mr. Malakowski summarized the outcome of method 1B. And again, we can see here a table with medians and averages, maximums and minimums. And minimums. Um, but the judge was not very impressed. In my view, there are significant difficulties in accepting the Malakowski method 1B. This method does not rely on analysis conducted by Mr. Malakowski himself, but by Markables. Their steps, by now the Markable steps, involve a number of assumptions that are not detailed and cannot be tested. Further, their exercise takes a starting point. The purchase price allocation is prepared by an outside appraiser for other purposes, being the acquisition of these groups, right? And they were based on assumptions that are not before the court and cannot be tested. So the judge concludes, I don't like 1B, we're not going to use that. <clears throat> Thus, the Markables implied royalty rates are the product of two levels of analysis, each of which involves making a first of assumptions that are not before.